Good morning, church family. Uh, welcome to the beautiful uh, Okanagan Valley. And we are, if, if you know where we are, you get nothing, but you know where we are. That'd be cool if you know that. Um, it took a little bit of work to get here, so just know that I sweated a little bit and, and Jason sweated a little bit just to get here. So um, hopefully that's something. Easter's been my favorite day of the year for several reasons. Growing up, my mom, we, she would often get us new shirts and we would go uh, kind of dress up for Easter and we would get to eat food and uh, celebrate with everyone and, and the fact that God is alive and that that means we get to live forever. Um, it also means that it's finally springtime and we get weather like this, hopefully, on the coast where I used to live. We never really got this kind of weather, but close, kind of almost. Anyway, the fact that Christ died for us and uh, was raised back to life, it, just, it was a big deal. This year has been a slightly different story, and I'm afraid I haven't been looking forward to it quite as much as I normally have. And, and so reason number one is we don't get to fellowship together and see everyone. Two, we don't get to eat food together. And three, it's easy for pastors to get kind of sucked into the feeling of pressure around Easter because it's kind of one of the two Sundays of the year that a ton of people get to come to church and it seems like Easter is our big chance to change someone's life forever, you know. Um, and, and so just Easter always gets me thinking of ways that uh, I can wow people with some cool or profound story about the resurrection. And I've, uh, I've tried to teach on the resurrection before, but most of the time I just can't put it into words what it means to me. It just, it means a lot to me and it makes me feel uh, just incredibly grateful. It gives me goosebumps when I read John's account of this story. The story just gets me. And if you've ever journeyed through the Gospel of John and gotten to know each of the characters in the story, uh, the resurrection of Jesus is just so incredible. And uh, this week I was I was messaging the youth group kids on uh, Facebook and I was asking them which part of the resurrection story was their favorite. And I started naming parts that I love the most. And uh, I love it when Mary Magdalene looks in and finds the tomb empty. That's just one of the goosebump parts. I love it when Mary thinks that Jesus is the gardener and, and doesn't recognize him at all until she hears him say her name, Mary, and then she, she recognizes him. And I love that John mentions that he and Peter had a foot race on the way to the tomb and that he mentions that he totally kicked Peter's buns on the way there, which I thought was just kind of funny that he mentions. But um, the whole story and the reactions and the joy and what it means for us is, is incredible. Um, the whole point of talking about this stuff is, is that for me, it makes me want to get in the Bible and read it. So let's do that. So John chapter 20, verse 1 says, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one who Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciples started, started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. Well, the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed, for until then they still hadn't understood the scripture that said Jesus must rise from the dead then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw the two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been laying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. She said, Sir, if you have taken him anywhere, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. And then Jesus said, Mary. And she turned to him and cried out, Rabbani, which is Hebrew for teacher. 
And Jesus said, don't cling to me, for I haven't ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And then she gave them his message. So this text always just kind of blows my mind. The power of God is just beyond anything that I can wrap my mind around. And as it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 24, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So that means Christ, the fact that he was raised from the dead, demonstrates the power of God as well as his wisdom. And this is the most ultimate demonstration of love for us that could possibly ever be shown to us. And I want to speak right now to anyone who's feeling condemned right now, or if you think you've messed up in your life too much or too often or too long, if you just messed up again in the very thing that you've been trying so hard to steer clear of, God still loves you and he still wants you. God didn't just decide to save us on a whim. He's been planning from the beginning to do this. If you know how there are some things in life that you, you do because you're looking at the big picture. Does anybody ever, ever think about the big picture? I know all of you think about the big picture of things. But so changing your oil in your car, that's, that's a big picture thing because you want your car to, to last for a while. Brushing your teeth, exercising, getting, getting an education. These are things you, you don't just think of one day and say, oh, I think I'll have a little toothbrushing today. That'd be fun. But you're, uh, you're doing these things so that you'll have a future with, with your car, with your teeth, with your health, with your education, with your job. You're doing these things for a purpose, and it's a big picture purpose. And so God didn't just decide to do a little saving one day just for fun. He's been preparing to do these things for those who love him since the beginning. He was playing a long game. He was looking at the big picture so that we could have a future with him. He knew it was going to cause himself great pain and suffering, but he loves us so much. This brings me to a place today where I just want to do something that pleases God. All of this stuff that God has done for me, dying on a cross, sending his son to die on a cross, uh, the resurrection, um, so that we can have a future with God. It just makes me want to please him more. And do you know what I mean when, when you just, you want to please someone so bad just so they know how much you love them or, and care about them? And it, it uh, makes me think of my wife. And, and a few months after I met Emily, um, I, I realized that I, I really wanted to get to know her better. And she really wasn't into giving me the time of the day at, at that point in, in life for some reason. I was a little bit of a flirt at that point and And uh, she wasn't into that. So, so I went to work demonstrating that I cared about her and that she was important to me. And at this time, she was working at a little coffee shop in uh, LaConnor, Washington. It's called Calico Cupboard. And uh, the shop was about 49 minutes from Warren Beach Camp where I lived and worked. And the, the coffee shops opened at seven o'clock and I had to start work at eight o'clock. So I would get there before the shop opened and I'd probably be asleep in my car when it opened at seven. And I'd run in there with probably some flowers. I did that a couple of times and, and uh, I'd, I'd order coffee. I would tip her a giant amount, jump back in my car, race all the way back to Warren Beach Camp and hopefully get there um, by the time I was supposed to uh, get to work. So aside from that, if anybody wants some, some pointers on how to be a creepy boyfriend, uh, I can give you a few tips on that for, for sure. <laughs> I don't suggest that you be a creepy boyfriend. The truth is I'd never dated anybody. I had no idea what I was doing. And I just really, really wanted her to know that I loved her and I cared about her. And so I was, I was thinking of any way I possibly could to, to do that. And uh, Obviously it worked, but it took me all of eight years to convince her that marrying me was maybe a good idea. And I, I, the, the jury's still out on that one. But my point here is, after all that God has done for us on the cross and in our lives daily, why aren't we trying to do everything we can to demonstrate our love for him? Why aren't we just trying to do anything we can that would be pleasing to God? And I think for me, it's my mindset and how I think through each day. I often I don't stop to consider what would be pleasing to God. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews 13 16 says, 
Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Psalms 147, 10 through 11 says, His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Here is we need to have faith in God, do good, share what you have with others, fear God, and hope in his steadfast love. These are all great things. When, when we do these things, we, we please our Father. Why do we want to please our Father? Or why does it please our Father? Uh, because we're trusting him. We are putting our hope in him. We are respecting him. We are loving him. And uh, I guess what father wouldn't want that sort of thing? Like, wouldn't that please you as a father? If, if, the, if, your, if your children were doing those things for you. And so these things are pleasing to the Father. It says that in the Word. Um, today is a celebration of the love and the power of our God. To marvel at what He has done for us. Today, instead of focusing on how we can please ourselves, let's focus on how we can please God. Let's have faith in our Father. Let's do good and share what we have. Let's fear God and hope in His steadfast love. Let's remember what steadfast means means firm and unwavering. The love of our Father is firm and unwavering. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we are so grateful for how you've loved us, how you've uh, cared for us. Thank you so much for, for dying for us and for rising so that we can live in eternity with you. Thank you for looking at the big picture and even though we just are this small tiny piece and we, we have no ability to look into the future even, and uh, thank you that you do that for us. Um, thank you for, for being who you are. God, help us to, to learn how to do the things that please you. Help us to think of that every day of our lives, how we can better please you. We're so grateful for you and what you've done. We love you. Amen.